we're going to look at a more realistic example. So that's kind of toy code and fairly obvious that I was doing something wrong in the memory management. But we'll look at some real code and see the kinds of things that go wrong and why they matter. It's from a program called FingerD. A lot of the programs you'll see in Unix, and you've seen this with HTTPD, they, they end with a D on the name, which stands for either daemon or daemon, depending on how you like to pronounce things. And it basically means it's a program that starts other programs. So FingerD was a program that would start the program Finger, and Finger would tell you if someone's using that machine, if they're logged in, and maybe, maybe some more things about what they're doing. This is before you had pokes in Facebook. You had finger in Unix. Is anyone actually running uh, BSD 4.3 or code derived from that today? It's like to me at least half of you are. Yeah. Um, OK, yeah. So BSD is still part of the code and lots of the systems you're running. Probably not too much of the actual code that was in BSD 4.3 is still there. But this is the, the path that we were on, right? So there's a path from BSD through next step to Mac OS X and iOS that judging from the laptops I see about half of you are running and probably some more also has, have iPhones running. So you probably are running some code that is derived from BSD 4.3 today. Most of it has been changed since then. But these red lines are, are the actual code base going through this path. And before I show you how bad the code is, I, I should explain how good and important BSD was. So does anyone know what BSD stands for, since we're all, almost all running it? Yeah. Uh, very close, yeah. So it's Berkeley Software Distribution. So the B stands for Berkeley, which is a, a university in California. And Berkeley had a project to develop this operating system, and they gave it away. Right? So this was back in the 70s and 80s when universities were, at least public ones, thought they had some mission to serve the public not just to get bigger and move up in the rankings. So they put a lot of resources in developing this free operating system, giving the source code away. And they started with the code that AT&T gave away in an early version of Unix. And over the years, developed that code base. And as we got into the 90s, AT&T started thinking they could make money from Unix. Their consent degree, decree changed a little bit. They were no longer barred from the computer industry. And they started a division that was trying to make money out of Unix and they sued Berkeley. That lawsuit blocked distribution of the 386 port that was under development. So this is why Linus Torvalds had to start his own 386 version of Unix instead of using the, the main distribution that had been developed since then. The lawsuit got settled a couple years later, and they had to remove three lines of code that AT&T seemed to have a, a claim on. But the vast majority of it was still maintained as, as BSD. It became called BSD Lite after those three lines were removed and a few other little changes. If you read this article that I will have linked from the course notes, at least according to Charles Babcock, BSD 4.3 is the single greatest piece of software ever created. It's actually a, a, an interesting article. I'm not sure I would agree with him that BSD 4.3 deserves to be number one on that list, but he's got lots of interesting things on his list and makes a pretty good argument for why BSD should be number one on that list. So there are a lot of really good things about BSD. We're going to look at one of the, the not so good things about it. So this is the source code for the finger daemon that runs as a network program. It accepts input from the network and will start the finger process passing the input that came in over the network to it. So here's what that's doing. So it's getting from standard input, which is going to end up coming from a network socket, this line, which is the parameter to finger. And then it's doing fork. So what is fork doing here? So did you use fork in problem set two? Yeah, so hope, hope you hopefully didn't use it explicitly, but you were using it indirectly, right? So when you were, whatever you were doing using the REST library to start a new process, at some point was calling fork. Right? And fork is provided by the C library to create a new process. And so what this is doing is creating a new process, and depending on whether you're the parent or the child process, you know which one you are based on the result of the fork. So within the child process, it's calling exec cv, which just runs a program, running the user ucb finger program and passing in that, that input. How do we like this code? So we don't like it because it's C, but otherwise, as, as far as C code goes, how do we like it? So what is the, this, this line doing? Get us, gets a string. So get us to the function that reads from standard input. Uh, actually, this shouldn't have been there. 
modified a, I modified the patch version of this code, not the actual code. So it's getting a string from standard input. It's reading that into this buffer. And if you read the current manual, it's very clear that you should never use this function, which isn't completely correct, but it's a very dangerous function because it can read any amount. So, so when does a string end in C? When you get to this null character, right? That's what ends a string. So Geddes is going to keep going until you get to that end of file, which ends up being a null character in the string. So if you pass in a long string, it keeps going, writing over the buffer, doesn't care when the buffer ends, it doesn't even know when the buffer ends. So the buffer here in the BSD implementation of FingerD was allocated with 512 characters. So that seems long enough. That's probably as long as anyone's username. Probably plenty long to hold it. If you're reading into that buffer from standard input, which is now hooked up to a network socket, is that long enough? Yeah. Well, not if the person on the other side of that network socket isn't cooperative. So what's going to happen? First, the fix, right? At least the, the first patch to it is to use fgetS, which sets a maximum number of characters to read. And if you pass in the size of the buffer correctly, that's going to stop reading once you get to that size regardless of how many characters are there. But with getS, it's never going to stop until the input stops. Let me actually show you more what's going on running it before we get back to that code. So here is what the stack looks like when we're running finger decode. We have these variables. These are all on the stack. And we have 512 bytes of line. Those are just a chunk of memory on the stack. We have some other variables. The way at least the, the compilers they were using to compile BSD worked, static string like this, which now would be stored in a separate read-only page, was just stored on the stack. So somewhere up the stack, we also had the string that was being passed in the, the exec feed. If you wanted to own one of the machines that was running this program, what would you do? Yes. OK, good. So you're going to overflow, right? You control line. So if you're controlling the input to line that's getting passed to get us, so you can control this input, and you can keep going, right? And all the values that you do keep going up the stack. OK, what do you want to put here? What do you want to replace those characters with? What's the most useful program to run instead of the figure program? Some of you implemented something like it last week, or at least Sunday night, maybe earlier last week. What program do you want to run? I think some of you implemented one recently. What's the most useful program to be able to run on a machine that you're trying to control? What program can run every other program? The shell. The shell. Yeah. You want to run a shell. Once you've got a shell running on someone else's machine and they didn't have gash, but you want to run whatever the shell was there. I think it was bin sh. You know, once you can run the shell, and you can give whatever input you want to the shell, then you own the machine. You can run any program you want. You'd like the shell to be running as root, right? You asked the question about sudo. And finger may not have been running as root, so you had to do something else to get the shell running as root. But you're getting pretty powerful once you have a shell. And so here's code that does that. They've allocated a buffer that's 536 bytes long instead of 512. So they've got space for 24 extra characters. So they're going to bash those 24 extra slots on the stack. What are they putting in that buffer in those extra spaces? Well, it's a little harder to read because it's got characters in and is a little backwards where things are going in. So it's actually by word. So I drew the stack one byte at a time. It's actually four bytes at a time. Each stack entry was a word. You've got bin sh. And you need a few other things to get that running. But basically, once you've got that running, you're going to send that over the network and see if you get yourself a shell. And then you can do everything you want in that shell. This was actually what the Morris form did. So this was the first big malware incident on the internet that happened in 1988. I have links, and you can see some of the email experts about dealing with this. So this, this was you know, a really big incident at the time. And until this incident, the internet was sort of a safe and friendly place. People didn't worry about security too much. It was mostly universities and uh, a few companies that were all collaborating on, on government projects using it. The worm was written by a, a student at Cornell at the time. And it had a few bugs in it that made it spread a lot faster than he intended. It wasn't intended to take down the internet, but it ended up taking down about 10% of the internet at that time, which, which was a few thousand machines. The internet was pretty small, but still a, a big deal. If you want to see the source code, you can go to the Boston Museum of Science. And there's a floppy disk. 
I don't know how enlightening that is to see a floppy disk at the Boston Museum of Science. You can also go to the course notes and see the actual code. There's a great essay that Paul Graham wrote about what you should do in college. I don't necessarily completely agree with everything in it, but I would strongly encourage everyone to read it. He's talking about his friend Robert who got kicked out of grad school. This is the one that was writing the worm that ended up taking down most of the internet and envying him as finding a way to get out of grad school without the stigma of failure of the pain of having to write a dissertation, which uh, I don't actually recommend that approach. And he did have about three years probation and a big fine and stuff. So it's not the easiest way to, to get out of writing a dissertation, but it seemed like at least a good idea to Paul Graham. Now the penalties are much higher now. So it's uh, probably actual lots of jail time, not just probation. But back in 1988, they didn't really have laws against computer abuse that were, were very enforceable. What Robert Morris is doing today is being a professor at MIT. So he sort of managed to turn out OK. How do we prevent this kind of problem? Right? So if we're going to run lots of programs on our operating system, we're going to run lots of programs. Maybe they're user level. There's still programs that have privileges to do things that might, might access almost all the resources on the machine. Right? They could be running as root. How can we prevent this kind of a problem, assuming we can't convince everyone to rewrite all their C code in a memory safe language. What are things we might do at the operating system or architecture level? So if someone was running BSD 4.3 on a machine today, but with modern compilers and modern hardware, would this attack still work? So that string, yeah, go ahead. Good. So you'd have to change the exploit some. This way of doing it wouldn't work. A modern compiler doesn't store string literals on the stack anymore. And a modern compiler stores a string literal in a separate page in memory. And what's special about that page in memory that we saw, I think, last class, maybe two classes ago? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a read-only page. Right? That's why if you write a C program today that tries to modify a byte in a string literal, it will give you a seg fault. It's a read-only page. You're not able to modify it. And this is mostly not done for security, but it does provide security in, in some way. So this wouldn't be possible today, because this would be stored on a read-only page. But Robert Morris was pretty smart. So could he have modified the exploit to still work if the, the string literal wasn't there? Ah, OK, good question. Yeah, so what makes the page read-only? This is what the entries in the page table look like on the ARM processor. What they look like on the x86 or AMD, other processors are pretty similar. And there's a bit somewhere here. Not actually sure which one for sure. So there's some bit that's whether it's reader, reader writable. Right, so there's some bit in the page table entry that says, can you write to this page? That is enforced by the hardware. So if you try to write to a page that you do not have the right bit in the page table on, the hardware will generate a, a fault. And then the OS can handle that, and it's, it's usually going to end up as a seg fault. So that's going to lead to a fault from the hardware that goes to the OS that ends up giving a seg fault to your program. If you try to write to a page that's marked read-only. Who marks the page as read-only? So it's not up to the hardware to mark those pages. Right? It's up to the operating system to set those bits in the page table. This is just a data structure in memory that the operating system can write to. So it's up to the operating system to set this. The kernel will set that bit. And if the kernel and the compiler are all well connected, and the compiler wants the string literals to be on a read-only page, there'll be a directive to the OS that when it loads that program, it will know to put those on a read-only page and set that bit in the page table correctly. So it's a combination of the compiler, the operating system, kernel, and the hardware that are all working together to enforce this. Okay. Good question. That's how the read-only worked. So suppose we had our string literal stored on read-only pages. So you can't just replace the string literal in memory. But there are other things on the stack that you can do. Right? Somewhere on the stack, there's a return address. That's where the code is going to jump to after that function ends. If you're trying to exploit this code, what do you want the return address to be instead of pointing to the right place? Yes. Exactly. Right. So you want the return address instead of where it was pointing. Now you're going to make the return address point to code that you can modify. We can make it point to here. Point to somewhere that you were able to write to. And then you can put whatever code you want there, and it's going to run that code. 
So that's the way most stack smashing attacks worked, at least until it got harder. And we'll talk about how it got harder. This was a very special case where all you had to do was replace a string on the stack to be able to run your shell. Normally, you would have to put some code on the stack and jump to that. So if you want to prevent this more general kind of attack, are there things that you could do? The read-only pages is sort of on the right track. What kind of page do we want to prevent that? It's not a read-only page, because we certainly need to be able to write to the stack. Yes. Exactly. That's exactly what you're looking at here. So we had read-only pages. Doesn't work for stack, right? The stack must be on a writable page. What we want for the stack is to be non-executable. We want it to be the case that if a program tries to run an instruction that it loaded from the stack, it's not allowed to. That we can't treat anything on the stack as an instruction. So the way hardware changed to support that was adding an extra bit in the page table, which is on most platforms called the NX bit, that if that bit is set, you can't execute instructions loaded from that page. So that's what a no-execute page is. It's, again, a combination of the, the kernel code and the hardware working together. So what the kernel code needs to do is set that bit. It's up to the OS to set that bit to be one for pages that might be vulnerable to an attacker that you want to prevent the attacker jumping to. What the hardware does is if the CPU tries to fetch an instruction from a location that's on a page where the NX bit is set, that will produce a fault. Hardware can tell when you're loading from memory whether you're loading something as an instruction or you're loading it as data, because either you're fetching it as an instruction or it's an, an input that you're using as data. And if it's an instruction and it's from an NX page, you get a fault. This will prevent attacks that depend on jumping the code that's inserted in, in data that's on pages that are marked for the NX bit. In the case of the Morse worm, well, this wouldn't have actually prevented it, because we saw they didn't actually have to put code on the stack, they just had to change some value in data. They just had to change the value of that string to run a shell instead of running finger. So the other defense, which might help with this, is if you made it harder to figure out where you had to change things on the stack. So there's been a, a lot of work on trying to make that harder. And it's also probably not at the point in most of the operating systems you're running that it would prevent this particular attack if someone was running this old version of FingerD and the string was still on the stack. Your goal is to, to make the locations of these things unpredictable. So maybe instead of putting that there, you're going to put that there. And instead of putting line there, you're going to put it there. And the locations of all these things will be unpredictable to the attacker. This makes things a little harder to generate exploits. It's pretty limited in terms of how much protection it really gives you. As an example, so we talked for this one about this is really bounds checking. Right? This is saying you've got some array in memory, and an attacker can go off the end of it and overwrite other things. There are lots of other problems. So you could fix that by just adding bounds checking, right? which is expensive and not done by default in C. Another example, which is the one I showed you in the code before all this, where we had two frees. And you mentioned, yeah, well, understanding what happens when you have two frees depends on understanding what the memory manager does in a lot of detail. There are lots of tricky things about this, but there are also ways to exploit it when it's done wrong. This was as, as recent as a few years ago, if you can't read these dates, that uh, people were, were still finding lots of new ways to exploit code that has these kinds of bugs in it. From reading this, and I don't recommend reading the whole thing, but I'll show you a few highlights. This is basically talking about the kind of arms race there is of systems patching these kinds of vulnerabilities and it getting harder to exploit them. You have people with quite interesting names doing things that are finding ways to exploit these. And, and they all depend on sort of low-level details of how memory management is done. You should already be familiar, of course, with how malloc works and the, the chunk headers, but maybe not these details of these fields. And there are ways to exploit that. And we won't get into the details of this, but uh, it's fun to read if you're interested in that. Not always tastefully written, but at least unlike some of the hacker documents, this one is acknowledging there might be, might be female hackers, although only in parentheses. These are all old problems that go back to C in the 1960s. Does C++ solve them? Can you have double free problems in C++? Sure. C++ 
just renames these things. All delete means is another way of doing free. All new means is another way of doing malloc. So you can certainly have multiple frees in C++. And there are actually plenty of other, other things that can go wrong. OK, what about Java? Can you have double frees in Java? Do you have any frees in Java? No? OK, good. Yeah, so you don't have any frees in Java. So that sounds like you probably can't have a double free. Can you have a, a bound error? Like if, you, if input is larger than, than your array? Well, you can have it, but it doesn't bash the next data structure. You get a runtime error if you try to go off the end. But how does Java avoid these double free problems? So if you don't have freeze in Java, what's happening after you allocate memory? So we're on the right track, right? So what Java is doing is implicit memory management. You don't explicitly, as a programmer, have to tell Java when you're done with things. What it's doing instead is garbage collection. This means, as a programmer, you don't have to explicitly allocate memory or deallocate memory. It's all up to the runtime system to figure out how to do that. And the way a garbage collector works, at least the cartoon version of it, you have on the stack, everything that's on the stack you can reach. And some things on the stack point to things on the heap. And some things on the heap point to other things on the heap. And there's some things on the heap that are not reachable anymore. When the garbage collector runs, it's looking for those things that are not reachable and cleaning them up and reclaiming that memory. Right? If it didn't reclaim memory at all, then every time you allocate an object, you're never getting that memory back to use. You're going to waste a, an awful lot of memory. So it is reclaiming memory, and it's doing it by looking for objects that are garbage. It's going through the stack, following the pointers on the stack. Everything that it can reach from the stack is not garbage, because you could still use that. Everything that it can't reach ends up being garbage. This sounds wonderful. right? As a programmer, you don't have to worry about memory management. You don't have any of these kinds of bugs people have with C programs. Why are we using Rust instead of Java? Why don't we want to use this in the language we're going to use to build high-performance, scalable, robust code or write an operating system in? So the way Java is typically run is using a virtual machine, right, which is more expensive than running natively. Every instruction is getting interpreted. But there's no reason you couldn't compile Java to run natively, and people have written compilers for Java. So let's assume you could do those things to, to make Java perform well. And people, generally JavaScript, there's a lot of effort making it perform well now. And even though it also has automatic memory management, JavaScript ends up with, with pretty good performance, not close to what you can get with C or, or with Rust. So certainly performance is part of it. Right? There's a lot of overhead that you need to do this garbage collection. And there are different ways to do it. The, the way I've described is, is sort of the, the simplest at mark and sweep way of doing it. The other way. Often, you can keep track of references as they go. Right? That's also expensive. And there are ways to do this that are smarter than just having to walk all of the memory every time. But what, what are other reasons we might not want to, to have a garbage collector managing all of our memory automatically for us? So how well can you use multiple cores if you're doing this? So let's see. If you had another, another thread, right, each thread has its own stack. So we would have another stack. So we have, this is thread one. Thread two, and it could have pointers to some of these. So, what does a Java program have to do when it runs the garbage collector? Okay, good. So, right, we certainly can't just look at one thread. Right, if we just looked at one thread, we would end up thinking these things. Are, this this one is garbage, which is not. So, we better look at both threads if we're going to do do garbage collection. We need to look at the stacks for both threads. What else do we need to worry about? Which thread should we do the garbage collection in? So the garbage collection has to run, right? The garbage collector is a, a part of the process. Some instructions that we run. Which thread should we do it in? OK, good. So we could start a new thread that runs just the garbage collector. Maybe that's a, that's a good idea. When the garbage collector runs, what should happen with the other threads that are running? If they keep going, they could be changing these things, right? So maybe in the garbage collector, you're keeping track of where you are on the stack looking through things. But while it's running, well, this thread could change something, be changing what's on the stack. So if we're going to make that work correctly, we probably need to stop all of the other threads when it's running. Almost all garbage collectors work until recently. If we want a garbage collector that can run while threads that are using the memory it's trying to collect are still running, we've got to be really careful. And people have tried to develop garbage collectors that run in a separate thread. But there are lots of complexities to this. And there's lots of loss of control. So it definitely has a performance issue, 
as well as now if your program doesn't perform well, it's pretty hard to figure out why. You don't have control over that. So that's why we're not using a garbage collector. It certainly makes things tougher, and we will talk more about that next class. And I will post exam one either when I get up to my office or I'll actually post it from here so I don't forget so you can get started on that. Now that we've talked about this, you're free to use any language you want for problem set three and future assignments. But if your submission has any of these vulnerabilities that would let someone like Robert Morris back when he was young exploit your code, then you'll get a negative 10, which when the maximum score is usually a one, is very hard to average out with other assignments. So I would encourage you to think carefully about that if you want to use, use any of these dangerous languages.